Welcome to Investable Partnerships, where we talk to industry leaders about growing revenue generating partnerships. I'm your host, Des Russell, and co founder of Partner Elevate. And the daily battle for partner success is forcing channel leaders to rethink how to maximize their relevance and value so they can be a driver of partner impact. So let's jump in and find out how. Welcome, Steph, to the Investable Partnerships podcast. It's great to have you join me and my audience and share with with everyone what is 10 plus years experience in channels and partnership roles, with the last eight uh, being uh, at Salesforce as regional vice president in Singapore and working across the ASEAN region. So I'm excited about this conversation and I'd love for you to kick off with introducing yourself to the Investable Partnerships audience. So over no to prob- you. No problem. Thanks, Des. Uh, I'm excited, slightly nervous about being here first first time. So this is going to be fun and exciting. Uh, so I've been uh, in the partnerships world for, uh, I don't want to say because it'll show my age, about 20 years now. Uh, I started yeah. off as, as, you know, kind of an inside partner manager uh, actually no before that I started off in sales and then kind of moved into inside partner management and since then you know I've done a bunch of different roles and uh, my most recent is is running partner sales for Salesforce for our ASEAN business and through this I've had the uh, definitely the the benefit of working across Australia New Zealand done an APAC role, uh, managing a large GSI and uh, and then run some resale business and now partner sales. So it's definitely been fun, exciting, and I'm excited to to be here and chat to you guys about it. Love it. So you mentioned your journey from IT sales and then yep. into partnerships. Yep. So undoubtedly that's given you a uh, a unique and help shape your experience in this particular industry. How do previous roles help you understand the importance of partnerships? Was there something that you identified in your sales role in terms of where partners fit in into being successful in sales? Um, how did that come about? It's a funny story, and I'll t- I'll tell you kind of the background and and why it's it's funny. So yeah, absolutely, I was. Uh, I did a very technical degree, so I, I, you know, Indian Indian background, so got to got to work with the with the you know parents and and what they want. So did an IT degree, majored in networking, and uh, interestingly, when I was going for interviews for a sales role, I was actually positioned in for an SE role, like a junior SE role in in an organization, yeah. my first organization. It was really interesting. The SE leader kind of obviously saw something in me, put me forward for an inside sales role. And I worked in in the inside sales team for a couple of years. And it's my manager. And I have to give him full credit for this. Um, he saw something in me. And he was the one who told me that I should look at partnerships. Uh, I met him. And the reason is funny, I met him just randomly. we have obviously now in different uh, different organizations, different parts. And I met him in Singapore recently, just at a bar and he's based in Australia, but he was, um, he had flown in for, for an event and we were like, Oh my God. Hi. And so we were reminiscing and, you know, I do believe that sometimes really good leaders play a really, really important role in shaping. And what he saw in me was, and this is when, when I'd asked him, many, many years younger, uh, I'd asked him, what is it like? Why does he think it, I should look at partnerships? And he, his feedback is I built great relationships. So great for sales, but even, even more important for partnerships. He was a big believer in working with partners. And because of that, in my inside sales role, I worked very, very closely with partners. So it helped me transition into an inside partner role. That was kind of the first of its kind in our country. And it helped me because I'd already 
worked with these partners on the sales function. It helped me understand, okay, for them to drive sales, what are some of the programmatic things we would need to do? And then, you know, what what kind of relationships we would need to have to have these partners then pitch our product over everybody else. So it did give me that unique kind of uh, move in. And then through that, I've then also had the experience of doing more kind of partners, you know, SMB, working with partners and and doing sales. So it's definitely helped me shape how we work with partners Mm -hmm. and understanding what is in it for them, right? Because ultimately it's easy to say, hey, Mr. Partner, sell my product. But then it's a whiffum. What's in it for me? What's in it for them, right? So it did give me that that lens. Yeah. So when you were in your customers, your sales role, which is kind of more customer facing role, yeah. I would imagine, and moving to partners, they kind of operate on the same principles. Sales role, you're looking for the customers that have got a need, uh, they've got money to spend, and there's an opportunity that you can uncover. On the partner side, you are looking at things a little bit differently. Yes, you're looking at partners that can sell but you're also looking for partners that can help help you either scale, help you unlock different opportunities or, or market reach or get you into different accounts. So, you know, on one hand, you're dealing with the customer where you can see a direct line of revenue. With partners, you don't always see that direct line of revenue. And as you said, it becomes a more, you know, there's this relationship that you have that you start to work with. So, what did you do in your previous roles that really helped you understand the importance of creating scalable partnerships or how we like to call it, investable partnerships? So the premise for me, honestly, is trust, right? They need to be able to trust what I am saying and, and I, I'll do what I say and then say what I do and and vice versa, right? Um, it was really funny when I moved you know, into, into Salesforce and I was working with one of the large GSIs, it it was a little bit nerve wracking because, you know, they're huge organizations. You're like, yes, you're working in a large organization, but you're just one little fish, right? So what, what is it that you can do? And so I, I remember it was sort of three months in and I always seek feedback. So I was, I, talked to the stakeholder. It was at an event. I was talking to the key stakeholder and I said, Hey, look, I just wanted to check in, you know, how's everything going? Are you getting what you need from me? Right? Like this was the first time the role was in place. So I just wanted to uh, check. And he was a tough, he came across as a tough stakeholder. He's not tough. And now that I've gotten to know him, wonderful guy, but um, pretty, pretty tough. He grinned at me and he said, Steph, we put you to the test right? You obviously didn't know, but we gave you some really tough challenges and certain things to go and do. And you just did it. You figured out a way of doing it. And honestly, that you passed the test and, and, and you're in, right? Like we now, it, it, it was a little bit of a, I had to prove myself and they yeah. had to then go right. You are like, if you said you're going to do it, you're, you, you do it. And for me, That was how I ended up. So relationship is important, but it's very much the trust. They need to know that if I say I'm going to go and go the extra mile for them, they're going to do it. I will do it. And then I'll ask the same from them, right? That's it's two ways. So that is really for me where you can then go. If you go then down the path of, you know, when you're running a resale business, when you're looking at an end customer, you can see the customer, you know that there is money on the table, you've got your AE working directly with the customer, but you've got that bridge with the partner. The reseller is the one that's gonna really help you get things over the line. Why would they do it, right? Sure, your technology is great, but they do it because the partner manager gives them a call. They're, the AE who they've built a great relationship gives them a call and goes, mate, I need your help can you do this? Can you help me? Right. And it's that that gets it over the line. So I've had resellers that because they completely trust and they have this phenomenal relationship with the AE, they have a phenomenal relationship with their resale manager. 
they go the extra mile. I've had resellers stay up till four in the morning to try and process an order just because yeah. they know it's our end of quarter. And, you know, which is about either, this time now, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's our end of month. So next quarter is our end of quarter. So they're, 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 they definitely know that Steph or a team's yeah. going to call, but <laughs> it makes it makes a difference because they trust you. And then, you know, they will come to us after and they will say, Steph, we've got a problem. We might have issues with credit or we might have this customer that's now like a different customer that's now kind of wanting to maybe backtrack a little bit. So then yeah. it's up to me to then or my team to go the extra mile to help them yeah. figure it out right? Yeah. You may not be able to fix the issue, but you become their trusted advisor and yeah. you're, you're working with them on, on this whole, on their business, you're invested in their business. So yeah. that's where for me, I, that's my, that's how, you know, it's always come innately. And that's probably what my yeah. first manager ever saw in me. Saw in you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Relationship, so, r- relationship person, you know, you're, yeah. you've got those key skills uh, around that. I mean, it's, uh, it's this thing that I talk about a lot and this is, um, this is really this, this trust and relevance or this relevance and value equation. I'd love to get your thoughts on this because, um, you know, to be a driver partner impact, um, I actually think it's not about always what you do, but it's always that you're doing things that are relevant and they have value in the relationship. And and to be relevant in the relationship, you actually have to be in the relationship because as that partnership changes, what they require or what's required in the partnership changes. So your relevance needs to change either to the market conditions or, or other conditions. And then the value is, what is the value that you're bringing at that particular point of the partnership? Because the value you brought right up front in the example that you you shared was they gave you a bunch of tasks, things to do. You got them, you got them over the line. So you've proved your value and you had relevance to helping them there. But then very quickly that partnership starts to change from the trust that you've built. So how do you as a partner leader maintain or measure the relevance that you are having and the value that you're giving the customers or your partners? Is it something that you measure or is it a feeling or do you look at this as in the outcomes of the partnership? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. There is no, for me at least, I don't know if there's a clear measure that you can look at. What I definitely do, and I can give you examples of this, but what I definitely see is their feedback, not just verbal feedback, but in the way they they do things, i.e. if I pick up the phone to a partner or my team picks up the phone to the partner, mm. are they more likely to get things done versus mm. if somebody else did, right? Yeah. So as an example, I have received feedback from my internal stakeholders that when either myself or my team is involved, things get done. And that is, for me, that's that's the value, right? Like I have built or my team has built enough relationship and enough credibility with the partner for them to go, right, we've got this for you guys, right? It becomes a little bit more personal than, hey, we're doing it for an organization. There's also, in terms of relevance, I think it's also important to look at where is the partnership at, right? There is, so as an example, I was in one of the countries in ASEAN um, a couple of, a a quarter or so ago, and I met this new partner. They're just, by new, I mean, they've just formed. They've got, I think, five people, uh, very invested in building, building a business with us. And I sat there and I was like, there's no point in me going down this path of talking about deals and because he was, he was in this, he's this, you know, the owner, the CEO, he was in this really vulnerable state of just telling me where he wanted to take his business. And he wanted to go from like five, 10 people this year to about 50 next year. And he was really proud of what he had achieved so far. So it was really lovely to, to listen And so I then just kind of gave him some advice based on what I had seen that other partners had had done, some mistakes they'd made. So I was like, look, if you're looking at investing in these areas, you know, maybe put some metrics in place. And, you know, so it was just, it was a really casual piece. 
And the end, this is what stuck with me, the end, at the end of the meeting, he goes, Steph, thank you. You are the first person that has come to us. You have not asked us for our business plan or anything like that. You've just been real and you gave me really actionable advice. And yeah. that for me was was validating, right? I, I went, yep, that's that's the job. Because now I know that the next time I go into that country, I meet him, he's going to be really proud. And he's going to tell me, yeah. guess what we've done, right? Yeah. And so that's how you slowly build those relationships because you're invested in their business. Mm. And then they they feel it very different to when you're working with a large GSI, right? Or, yeah. or a very, very established partner. Then it's about sometimes a little bit tactical. Like what can you do to fix either a problem or for for you to get out of a practice to go outside and to look at how do you work with an industry lead? How can you be relevant to the industry lead to help the practice go and drive value? So then, then you kind of become on the team with the GSI practice lead yeah. saying, hey, I'm going to help you. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to pitch to to your industry lead. We're going to go together and help you drive value. So it's very different depending on the situation. And that's why hard to measure it. I, I would look at them, you know, people talk about health of the partnership and they have scorecards and everything else. I, I, I look at if I'm working with a partner, are we growing, right? Like is our revenue growing together? not just my revenue, but is their revenue also revenue, growing? Yeah. Is it growing in the in the relevant areas of them? Like GSI, they would want their different industries that they want to focus on. Is that growing with Salesforce or the company that you're working with, right? If it's a small partner, they would have certain products that they would want to work with. Is that growing, right? And then it's also the soft pieces, right? It's the, hey, Steph calls or such and such person calls. Yeah, you know what? It's a little bit, mm, I'm not I'm not super comfortable, but because you and I have a relationship. Now, if you call me Des, I'll be like, sure, mate, like, let's figure it out, right? Let's work through this because I'm invested in you and you're invested in me. So it's a bit of both. There is the, yeah. you know, are we growing together? Like in, in the revenue sense in, in, in that area, but then it's yeah. also the soft Bit. You know, I love that example of the the partner that you went to go see that was kind of brand new to the Salesforce ecosystem. They've gone and invested a truckload of money in their business without kind of conversation at a Salesforce perspective. So I think the empathy that you showed actually going in there is probably something that I think your experience experience brings. But you don't need experience to show empathy, I would imagine, right? No. You just have to be a decent human being, right? Yeah. So I kind of like it's the when do you put the, as a partner leader, when do you put that playbook aside and when do you bring out the playbook, if you know what I mean? Yeah. You know? That's the tough one. I suppose maybe it's depending on wh where you are in your quarter. <laughs> you bring the playbook. <laughs> you know, I thought that exact same thing. <laughs> And a quarter. The the playbook comes in. Hey, you've agreed to these places. Revenue. Yeah. It's all There's about a revenue number. Yeah. Um yeah. like what look, do you think about that? Like, I mean, is that I don't know, this is quite a touchy feely thing because we've spoken about trust and now we're talking about empathy, but yeah, I think uh, I think that that's something we probably we probably need to be more mindful of as partner leaders is when to actually put the playbook mm. and when not to. And that that first conversation with someone who's invested on their own, yes, they've got growth trajectory, five to 50 in, in 12 months. You kind of go, okay, well, that's that, that's probably really, really aggressive. You're going to invest X amount more money. Well, actually, I just need to put the playbook aside and mm. have a real conversation with you and listen to you and validate where you are at. It, we, you talked touchy-feely, right? I'll, I'll put another one in there. It's I go based on my gut. I and it, it's probably based on on the experience. But when I'm speaking to somebody, I I try and put myself in their shoes and I go, okay, what do they want to hear right now? Because the 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 opposite is also true, right? When I do pull the playbook out at the end of quarter, when everybody's trying to close the deal, right? They put themselves in my shoes. 
because I am able to pick up the phone and I am able to say, hey, look, I know, yeah. I know this is going to be a tough conversation. And yeah. I will sometimes apologize up front for it. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest and I'll say, look, I'm really sorry, but this yeah. is, it's end of quarter. And I know it's really uncomfortable, but I'd really like for you to do ABC because this is super important for us, mm. right? Yeah. And so it, it kind of becomes this, you, in the situations that you don't use the playbook and you kind of look at look at where the partner is at or where the person is at, because sometimes it's not just the companies, right? It's the yeah. individual that you're speaking to. You'll look at where they're at. And if you go sometimes a little bit outside of your box and you help them, it's then easy when you're back in your box and they're back in their box for yeah. them to go. It's not the company that's asking this. It's Steph or yeah. it's Des. Right. So, yeah. so then it becomes this real, it's a, it's a dance. So you kind of go, Hey, um, this, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a twirl and then I'll come back in and I'll, you know, sell some away and then I'll do another twirl here or I'll do like a little, I'm not a dancer yeah. by the way, but you know, you kind of, you, you do that. And you, cause sometimes you feel the beat and then you just go, yeah, I could do this flashy woohoo thing. And then yeah. you come back and you, and you dance in your line. So yeah. it, for me, that's what it, it that's what it becomes. You you feel where you are, touchy feely. Yeah. But you feel it, it it is it is right. I know a lot of people look at partnerships and go, oh, it's really it's really like you know. And I was having this conversation this week when I was in Indonesia with someone where people kind of look at people in partnerships. So the broader. A group look at people in partnerships and go oh, it's really touchy feely and you have lots of lunches and you know there's there's this there's a thing right and yes some of it is true but but there is a lot that goes behind that right it's not just about going and taking someone out for lunch it is about having a genuine connection because you know that the next time someone like you know, when your sales yeah. leader comes or the business comes and says, we really need this from the partner. It's because yeah. you've done a couple of the lunches, you've had the the connects yeah. that you're then able to go the playbook and go, right, we need this yeah. from you. So how do you make sure for the CROs that are listening, uh, <laughs> we still want to deliver measurable outcomes? Yep, yeah. <laughs> just Not just the other thing. So how do you make sure your strategy stays fluid while still driving measurable outcomes in partnerships? So honestly, I run to a number, right? So okay. each, each each of the partners have a, a target with us yep. uh, and my team have a target. So even even though I, I know and I understand that we have to do all of these things a little bit outside the box, it ultimately comes back to, am I driving the number? And I'm very, for me, I'm very serious about that. My team, if you ask them, that you know, very serious. We run a, a regular forecast call and we run those forecast calls with partners. So we are driving the, the measurable outcomes back to their business and to our business, right? And we're also ensuring that through that, we're, we're continuing the relationships. We're also making sure that we're doing, you know, the right lead gen pipe gen activities so having measurable outcomes against everything that we do yeah. so that way every activity ends up in in an outcome that we are driving so it's not just sure sometimes you want to go and have a lunch with a partner but then have you spoken about the right two or three things and that's where sometimes the playbook comes back in mm -hmm. have you have you gone and then spoken about how are we going to do a pipe activity in a country to then generate some leads have you yeah. spoken about this particular large deal that you know is important for the sales leader to help move it forward right so you you work through it but for me it's ultimately based on what the, the business will want all of the alliances and channels people yeah. to be revenue generating and that's exactly yeah. what i i drive my team to as well uh love it so you know, from partnerships, I call us the um, the the connector of dots. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, because we are. If there's anyone who's going to have a good view across the entire operation, partner operations piece, or from sell to to sell with to sell through to your technical delivery to customer success, I think it's 
good partner leaders actually are able to connect the dots both internally and externally for their for their partners. How do you maintain that brand with the rest of the organization? How do you maintain the relationships with everyone in the organization? Is it is it that you are consistently advocating? Are you do you know your numbers and where they make an impact? What do you do to bring everyone along with your particular uh, strategy or with your particular partners? So when you have to have those hard conversations, you can, but also where you are able to utilize key people and key resources internally to help partners get unstuck. You know, you, you sometimes calling for favors, asking for favors, depositing some coins, withdrawing some coins. How do you do that as a partner leader? Is it a brand? Is it your brand? Is it knowing your numbers? Is it relationships internally? What is it that you think other partner leaders should be doing to make sure that they're building that? For me, and, and the way I've looked at it, it's it's a little bit of it, of it all, right? Like if you know your business and you know where your business is coming from, right? And I, for me, I'm looking at it not in a partner account management world. I'm looking at it in a sales, partner sales world. So that's where my alignment is. So if I know where my numbers and business is coming from, i.e. which countries, which partners, and where are their risks, I then align myself and my team to that. We, Because we know then, right, who do we need to leverage in the partner world, we also then know what's what happens on, on the on our side of the fence, i.e. is there a customer success issue coming? Do we need to get across that because that's then going to impact selling more uh, with that partner into that customer? If so, should I then do the right thing, go to my customer success leader and say, hey, something's coming up, let's work together to work through that. And for that, I need to have the right relationships internally. And so a little bit of that is my brand, a little bit of that is my relationships. And a little bit of that is honestly also having courageous conversations, being able to stand up and either advocate for the partner internally or advocate for my company externally. And so it's the it's the delicate balance. And that way you're not overly spinning yourself one way or another. So my, my stakeholders know that if I'm advocating in this instance for my partner heavily, yeah. they also respect that and know and trust that I'm doing the same on the other side. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit from the connecting of the dots piece, it becomes a negotiation. Right. So you kind of you're in both angles. You're trying to manage both with the outcome of a win for both. And so there is there is a large part of that, which is, you know, and it goes back to what I said. I I always do what I say I'm going to do. And so that's how I build my brand equity within my business as well as externally and then your partners correct and then that helps me drive the right conversations for both across uh, across the areas and it helps if i and my team we know our business because then we are talking the same language like we know the language to speak internally we absolutely know the language to speak with our partners so so yeah though that's I suppose my short, long answer to your yeah, question. No, I love the way you're thinking, and I'm, you know, I, th- I think, I think it it is a. There's a lot of feeling. There's a lot of there's a lot of gut feeling that is actually required in a lot of facets. You know, yeah. I don't think it's just partnerships. You know, whether you're on the sales side, but particularly in partnerships, I think that we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. Particularly, you know, if you're a individual contributor partner manager and you might you might not be working and you might work in the scale side of partnerships mm-hmm. and you might be working with 20 or 50 different partners like mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that you've got to think about in terms of where you're going to put your time energy and your effort and your resource to get that particular return and it's not an easy thing to do right it absolutely yep. isn't an easy thing to do particularly in a region like uh, like the ASEAN region right mm-hmm. so I'd love to tap into that from from your side because mm-hmm. in 
if we look at our, our audience uh, across APAC, APJ, uh, for Investable Partnerships, our podcast, you know, we've got individual contributors, we've got partner managers, we've got partner managers, partner salespeople, partner marketers on their own, sitting in regions somewhere, doing something. Do you have any advice that you've been able to sort of, or any experience that you've been able to gather over the, your 10 plus years in the region mm-hmm. about scaling partnerships in this particular region? Like maybe what's your one or two sort of points for other partner leaders who are in region and they're trying to either scale or they're trying to build partnerships? What would your two points of advice be to them? I am naturally inclined to outcomes driven, right? So for me, I, I go, everything that I look at, I look at, okay, what's the outcome that I'm trying to achieve? There's there's a lot of, now with my experience, a lot of gut feel in the way I get to that. But when I was younger, I used to look at things with the lens of, okay, if I want to get to growth and we want to build, so we've got you know certain partners that are strategically managed one-on-one partnerships and then certain partners that are managed at scale programmatically. What is the outcome that I want to achieve in either, right? Do I want to, in the scale world, try and drive growth and look at, you know, the next set of partners that we are driving, in which case can I do some interesting creative things outside the box uh, from a SPIF program standpoint? to drive that, right? So so for me, it's always look with the end in mind, right? What do you want to get to? And then work backwards. And what are the two or three things? You never want to do more than that because if you're trying to do a lot and you have all of these wonderful ideas, it's very hard to execute on it. So how do you then break it down and go, what are the two or three things that is going to be the biggest impact for your business as well as the partner's business. And the same applies if you're doing the strategic partnerships, the one-on-one engagement. What are the two or three things? If you're looking at a large uh, a large partner, you know, it, it always there's always this whole discussion on, you know, we need the partner to go and introduce us to new customers. And then the partner is going to sit there and go, yeah, great, but yeah, we, we don't have bench strength, right? So then you go, okay, well, how do I help them build bench strength? So then you kind of work backwards and you go really simply, well, what are the two things that I can do to help you get to the outcome that we both want to achieve? So for me, that's really where, how I look at it. It's the same when I tell my, my team, when, as we are trying to scale across, so we don't look after specific partners, we're across all partners in all markets. So what is the end goal for the sales leader, right? What do they want to drive? And then what is the impact you can provide, right? And then let's work backwards. So you have the one or two things that you are completely focused on for the year or for the quarter, depending on how that how it works. And then that's what you're driving to. And you're always advocating, right? So yeah. you're advocating yeah. for yourself. You're advocating for people. You're telling people. This is what I'm, this is what I said I was going to do. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. And so then it becomes easy and it doesn't become overwhelming because it's very easy to also get overwhelmed and go, oh my God, there's a lot going on. Yeah. So that, that's, that's my advice. Um, and so that's how I've always run, run my business. And, and like, in I, this region. yeah. And like I said, it becomes, it's now something that I, I, I don't actively, I don't, it's not an active thinking thing. It becomes yeah. like second nature. But yeah. the fact that you asked me that question, I was like, yeah, okay, this is yeah. this is how I've broken it down. And this is how then I explain it even to my team. Yeah, so it's a muscle that you develop. You've developed over time and yeah. that becomes second nature. I'd love to get your view on how would you define an investable partnership? What are the traits that define an investable partnership for you? What are the traits that define an investable partnership for me? And if you think about an invest, while you're thinking, I'll talk a little about, yeah. uh, give you some yeah. time to think. Investable partnership is a partnership that is worth the investment of time, energy, and resource, not mm-hmm. necessarily where you're going to see, you can see a return, mm-hmm. but how do you look at a partnership and go, I reckon this is investable, or I know that this is an investable partnership 
for me to bring my time, energy and resource to this particular partnership? I think it's different for different types of partners, right? Okay. So I think sometimes with, and I'll, I'll break it down in this way, because you've got, especially in Southeast Asia, you've got GSIs, you've got some local SIs, and some, some of them are resellers. So yeah. when it's a GSI, it ends up being your company tells you this is our strategy, right? Yeah. And so you have to invest and then you figure out the, okay, how, how are you relevant and yeah. build that piece in, right? So so there's a little bit on, on that front, it becomes a top down, we look at this partner as important. And that partner is important because at a global level, they are looking to build on your technology. They are looking to drive, you know, accelerators, vision, thought leadership with your technology. So it is worth the investment on that level, right? It's then how do you break it down and make it relevant locally? If you look at a regional SI or a smaller local SI or a reseller kind of in one of those buckets, it becomes a little bit more personal on the, you know, on the investment front. And what I mean by personal is not, not me putting my money, but really they're putting their money in it. Right. And okay. so for me, I, I sometimes work with these and I speak to the CEOs of these companies and they are, they're genuinely, they're investing their money because they believe in our technology. And so then I I look at, okay, what is the plan that they have? Is it is it a plan that is, you know, has the foresight to look to to do A, B, C, D, right? And to grow. And mm. if it if it may not, then do I spend because I see what they want to do and I see their personal investment in it, then do I then put in the extra time? to help them grow, right? And yeah. and the advice, like the example I gave, the advice that I would do. So so that's, for me, the two lenses, uh, you know, big, big company. And when I look at a, a, a smaller company, because for especially, you know, especially here, it may be less so in the in the mature countries where you get you know, outside investors coming in, in some of these countries here in Southeast Asia, the CEO is the person who's investing their money into this. So you then want to, you know, ultimately reciprocate. There are some cases where you might say, hey, and we have, it's it, we've tested, we've just gone, hey, you know, we want to try and, and work with this partner, but then their strategy was wrong. And so then you kind of look at it and say, mm, maybe that was, that was the wrong investment of time and resources but sometimes it's also it's also a little bit of test and learn right so yeah. you then know the next time if a partner looks like this you know they're predominantly for example a hardware partner and they suddenly want to move into software do they do they understand what that means do they understand what software as a service means do they understand cloud right it'll take them three or four years to get to that learning point do I want to wait? So it, you, you know, you can kind of gauge on that front, but then there are others that are, have a very clear vision. And, mm. and sometimes I challenge, I had a conversation where I did challenge a partner. They came to me and they said, look, we want to be your reseller. And I was like, well, I'm not sure we've got a lot of resellers. Right. So it was my team that pushed back. Then they said, no, they want to speak to me. So it was the same conversation and you yeah. could see the intent and the passion and yeah. the commitment they were giving. They were like, you know what, Steph, we're not going to let you down. We're going to do A, B, C, D. And you, you, then there is a large degree of trust. You go, okay, right. It's you, you sometimes have to go with, you know what? I really appreciate the tenacity. So, so maybe I will. So maybe I will lean in a little bit. You've lent in so much. So I'm going to now lean in and go, right. I'll take a chance. Right. Yeah. So, so there's a little bit of that, but then I think you also look at it, you know, with with regards to what is the company's vision and where do you want to go? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, um, there's those, you know, table stakes kind of things. Um, yeah. Can I give you my my view on this? And, sure. Um, it's kind of like a you've spoken about it, but there's kind of two things that I look for when I look for the investability of a partnership or whether a partnership is investable. And I had this in my days working in uh, the channel for Microsoft, et cetera. And there's two things. One thing is strategic autonomy is a capability 
Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about that. The other thing that determines whether a partnership is investable for me is market agility. These two things are, you can't have one or the other. You've actually got to have both. Both. And I think as a partner leader, we actually need to try and help our partnerships build these two things out or build this muscle. So the strategic autonomy piece is really, does this partner have the ability to act strategically with us, but autonomously? Yeah. So can they make decisions that are not based on what I'm only telling them or what we are telling them, but they can make decisions quite autonomously in terms of product, market, focus, customer, etc. Mm-hmm. They can leverage us for greater insight, but they've got to have some of this autonomous. And then secondly, autonomous thinking, secondly, strategic, they've got to be quite strategic in that. So they've got to have those key elements, uh, key elements around that. So strategic autonomy is the one key characteristic that I think we need to spend more time on with our partners. The other one is uh, market agility. And this is the ability for that partnership to adapt to the market. The market agility cycle is a lot smaller, right? It's like three, six, 12 months, but can they not pivot? I don't like the word pivot, but can Mm -hmm. they align to the market that we are either seeing or presenting to them? And can they actually do this in a really, a really short time frame? And I think like internally partners need to work on a whole bunch of stuff. But that to me is the two kind of traits that I look for when I think about investable partnerships. Can Um, I ask you a question now? Yeah, sure. Just on the market agility piece. Mm. How do you gauge, uh, for me, I get a sense, but how do you gauge or how? what's your advice on gauging market agility or the ability of a partner to do that? Especially in some cases, there is new partners that you're build, trying to build established relationships yeah. with. So, so how would you yeah. do it? Ask- I would ask three questions and yeah. look for an answer in between that. Yeah. Um, for me, market agility is actually built on what I call market context. Yeah. How clear is this partner about their market context and positioning in the market? Yep. And they need to be able to do three things. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to clearly articulate what does their customer need? Yeah. They need to artic- articulate what result do they give their customer mm-hmm. every single time? Mm-hmm. And thirdly, they need to articulate what they do best that makes them the best in the world at what they do. Mm. So that market context is what I look for in terms of the first grounding blocks of whether this partner has market agility. And the reason why those three are important is not all, not one is important. All three is important and they all come together in how that partner presents in the market. But if you have to unpack the what do they need, what does my customer need, the partner's got to have a very clear view on who their customer is, yeah. demographics, geographics, psychographics, what do they fear, what do they want, what mm-hmm. are their frustrations, what are their mm-hmm. aspirations. They have to have a good connection to determine what is the one thing their customer needs. Mm. So that's like if they've got that, I know that they've done that type of a, analysis. On the results side, they've got to be clear on the result that they give their customer. And this mm-hmm. is where I think partners get confused a lot. What they think about is the result is what they do. We are a data migration company. So we give the result we give our customers is a fully migrated, unified platform repository for data analysis. Yeah, that's what you do. But yeah. what result does that give the customer? Correct. So that tells me that they're not clear on actually the results of their customer. Yeah. And then the third thing is what they do best is how differentiated are they? Mm. Do they sound like everyone else or do they have something unique that they have that they use that gives the customer the result and then gives them what they need? So I can, can I just say I love yeah, sure. your articulation of it because, and this is maybe our different styles, right? I gut feel person, right? Mm. I would do everything, everything that you described. This is why I'm nodding my head. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. But I don't have, uh, I love you that you articulated it in two lines. These are the two things you look for. 
I, yeah. for me, it's, I have to have the conversation. I have the conversation. Yeah. Like, it's not just about looking at a business plan because once you have the conversation, you're able to gauge, you don't have to, and you, you know, every, everyone's different. I wouldn't ask those in those three areas, but somehow through that, whatever, 20 minute, one hour discussion, you, yeah. you I, for me, I'm able to gauge where they're at, but you articulated it perfectly yeah. well. <laughs> Totally well, I, I hope so because we have a, you know, we run a whole company on this as well. Yeah. So we've got some resources on our website if you're a partner manager and you want to go and understand how to help your your partners build market context and everything. You can go to our, our website. We've got a blog there, partnerelevate.com. Uh, but Steph, I love to finish off and it's end of quarter for us and it's okay. end of month for you. <laughs> Correct. So we've We've got to go make our CRO happy now. Absolutely. Okay? So, Absolutely. Um, so I like to finish off each episode with a little – now, you didn't know this was coming. No. It's, a, it's called a little rapid uh, fire round. And oh, it's, called the partner, it's called Partnerships Fast Five. Okay. okay. I'm gonna, I need T-shirts, Major, for sure. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a sentence. I would love for you to just complete it with the first word, that comes to mind. Mm. It's quick. It's off the cuff. There's no okay. right or wrong answers. Okay. And you will likely not lose your job based <laughs> on whatever you say. Okay. 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 <laughs> Let, let's, so, let's try this. Let's go. Ready? Okay. So partnerships thrive on? Trust. Partnerships embody? Mutual gain. Through partnerships, you can? Build strong businesses for? Uh, for each other. Cool. Partnerships spark? Mutual gain. Partnerships succeed through? Relationships. Love it. There, <laughs> partnerships fast five done. <laughs> I so wish you had told me about this. I could have prepped a little bit more. <laughs> there would, there would, then there would be no fun. It wouldn't be That's rapid true. fire. Around. That's it true. That's <laughs> true. So, Let's wrap up. It's been an amazing conversation. I know you're a little bit nervous, but I mean, there's so much gold in experience that you've shared with me today and our audience, and I'm super, super appreciative of it. If you had one piece of advice for partnership leaders looking to make their partnerships more scalable and more impactful, what would it be? What I said earlier, which is, you know, go with the outcomes in mind, right, for both parties and believe, right? Believe that you can do it. A lot of times I know I have through my career questioned, I mean, what am I doing? Is, is, it, is it the right thing? But believe because you have the best intention of your company and the partner in mind. So really draw outcomes-based conversation and believe in what you are doing. Love it. Love it, Steph. It's been so good for our audience. Can they connect with you on LinkedIn? Um, is there another way you want them to contact you? Because I'm sure in our region, there's so many people who can learn from you. Where can they go to find uh, and connect with you? So absolutely connect with me on LinkedIn. My handle is Escovias, G-O-V-E-A-S. Uh, through that, uh, I'm more than happy to also share my phone number or email address if people do want to connect. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to help, especially anyone who's still building and growing or anyone who wants to move and they want to understand what's happening in Southeast Asia, more than happy to share. So yeah, uh, please do reach out. I'm appreciative of that. Thank you so much, Steph. Thanks, Des. Thank you for listening to Investable Partnerships. Subscribe wherever you listen and visit investablepartnerships.com for the transcripts of today's show.